One of the great things about Christmas is all of your senses are engaged. You have the sights and the smells and the sounds. Anybody else's house smell like cinnamon and uh, cookies and uh, and all the lights? And you drive around and you know you get all the glow of all the lights and all the um, all of the stuff that comes with Christmas and. Um, you got all the Christmas music, and every sense is kind of enhanced. Um, that's why we have so many memories of Christmas, because Christmas is a time where the more senses that you, uh, that you engage, the more uh, things you remember. But we love Christmas. We gather with friends and family, and usually it's around food. And you, if you can't tell, I love food. Um, but it involves taste and sights and smells, and all of your senses are enhanced. And this is how God designed it. The more we are, uh, this morning we're going to take a look at how God established this from the very beginning. We know commu- this morning we're going to take communion. And it's something that the followers of Jesus have continued to do since the Last Supper. It was one of two ordinances that Jesus has instructed and left for us as Christians to participate in. It's referred to as the Lord's Supper, Communion, or the Eucharist. Um, and the Eucharist comes from the Greek word which means to give thanks. And the question this morning is, why a meal? Why this meal? And what's the point? And this morning, I, I'm going to title this sermon, God Invites Humanity to Dinner. And I think we're going to go through a lot of Scripture this morning. We're going to go from Genesis chapter 2 all the way up until um, the Last Supper. And, and this morning, I want you to see that God has invited humanity to take part in His kingdom, to take part in His life. And so I pray this morning that as we, um, as we do this, that you'll, that you'll have a whole new understanding of what communion is about you have a whole understanding, a better understanding of what Christ meant when he said, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't take part in my kingdom because that's really weird. But when we understand it and we have this picture of what Christ is saying, I, my prayer is that all of this is going to come together and you're going to wake up for the first time and go, oh my goodness, I never knew this. This just blew my mind. And so this morning... Um, the, the Lord's Supper is an invitation into life. And Jesus asked His followers to come and take part in eternal life. Take this bread and the cup, His body and His blood. It began at the Lord's Supper. But it's an invitation that was alluded to in the earliest passages of Scripture. I want to start in before the fall. Before Adam and Eve sinned, when God, right after God created the earth, he said this in, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, God establishes this idea of, of communing and having this meal with him. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the flesh of the sea, over the birds of heaven, and over the livestock, and over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven." and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, and Lord, you've shown me so much this week, Lord, so many things that I learned this week that I didn't know, Lord, and I pray that, uh, that as I share that with this uh, congregation this morning, God, that it will open their eyes, Lord, that they will, um, that they will see Christmas, and they, they'll see communion, and they'll see these ordinances that you left as such a, a fuller picture. And so, Lord, I pray that you will speak to our hearts today. I pray that you'll take me, hide me behind the cross, Lord. Lord, all my faults and frailties, all my insecurities, all of the stuff that I bring with me, Lord, it's not part of this. God, this is about you and who you've called us to be. 
And so, Lord, I pray that as we look at this this morning, God, that you'll speak to our hearts. And God, that we'll be able to celebrate this communion meal together in honor of you and remembrance of you. So, Lord, I pray that you'll bless this message now. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the beginning, when God created man, he appoints man to be his representative and invites man to use his creative power and his imagination to spread order and beauty of the garden temple to the rest of creation. That's what we just read about. God made man, and then he made him to have dominion over the earth. And as long as man stayed and abided in the rules that God gave him, everything was wonderful. But many people believe that the reason why Satan hated man so much, the reason why he rebelled was because God made man and then he gave him dominion over the earth. And Lucifer's like, why would he make man? He's less than I am. Why? He can't do half the stuff. He's got to eat. He's got to eat these trees. He's got to eat this fruit. He's got to do all this stuff just to survive. Why would he do that? And so Lucifer got all upset and rebelled and turned against God turned man against God. Genesis 2.9, it says this, and just bear with me, it's going to take a little bit to put this together, but I think it'll all come together. In Genesis 2.9, it says this, and out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that was pleasant in the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God invited man to partake in his plan, to partake in eternal life. Take this fruit. Eat of the tree of life. Eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So eat. Partake in my life. As long as you're eating this tree, you're going to live forever. He, he commanded it. It says, and the Lord God commanded them in verses 16 and 7, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that one you shall not eat of. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. This tree of life is an image of God's ultimate gift of creation. The opportunity to share in and receive God's own goodness and life. Being close to the tree meant you were in close fellowship with God, that you were close to God. Significantly, the tree of life is something meant for humanity to eat. In fact, it's for God's first commandment was to command humans to eat from all of the trees except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this meal, it's symbolic of life with God. God. Life with God leads to eternal life. And humanity was invited to trust and participate in the life and wisdom that God freely offers to whoever, whosoever comes. But there's a little problem. Adam and Eve forfeit access to the meal by choosing to define goodness and life on their own terms. They decided, well, I'll eat the fruit. We know Lucifer tempted them and said, hey, Eve, God didn't really mean you don't eat the fruit. And Adam, oh, it's, not, it's good to taste. Man, it looks really good. You'll know just like God. You'll be just like God. And they believed a lie rather than believe God. Isn't that, isn't that true for all of us at times? No. <laughs> I know better, Caroline. <laughs> but Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22, uh, 22 to 24, it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has, come like, or has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate ground from which he had taken. He drove the man out and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed a cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every direction to, the, guard, the way, uh, to guard the way to the tree of life. So man breaks his fellowship with God. God offered him everything. God offered him eternal life. God says, come, 
be, have dominion over this earth and rule this earth. And you're, I'm putting you in participation with me to rule this earth. And man decided, well, I know better than God. And so he ate the fruit. And because he ate the fruit, he's now sinful. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. We all became sin because wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all of us have sinned. So now we have another series of dinner invitations. See, even after Adam and Eve sinned and they broke this close fellowship with God, God continued to pursue a love relationship with man. A close fellowship. God wants, wants fellowship with man. So God finds this guy Abraham that he, who was willing to trust God, who was willing to believe him. To Abraham, go to a place that I haven't even told you and Abraham gets up and goes. By faith, and salvation comes that same way, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And so, the story continues, and God found Abraham was willing to trust him. So God sets up this covenant relationship with Abraham. So first, God continues to invite humanity to experience life through him, through these meals. And he sets up these Seven meals that we read about in the Old Testament. And we all, we know, we've heard these meals. We, we hear about it at Christmas time. Uh, but these meals, and we're going to talk about them. He sets up these meals as a way to get people to regularly participate in praise, in thanksgiving, in remembrance, in repentance. Through years of practice, these feasts help to form the people of Israel into a grateful, believing, and trusting community who could share in the goodness and life that God offers. So there's seven feasts, and I'm just going to run through them quickly. There's the Feast of Passover, where God delivered Israel from the death angel. Remember, Israel was in Egypt. We studied this last year where Israel was, they, they had gone into slavery in Egypt, and now God delivers them, and they come, and God delivers them. They walk across the Red Sea. When they're faced with certain death, God parts the Red Sea, and they walk across on dry land, and God consumes the armies behind them. And that was the Passover, the, the Passover where God was going to kill the firstborn son so Pharaoh would let the people go. But they had to kill a lamb and put the blood on the lentil and the doorpost so that the death angel would pass over. And so they did that when they, because they believed God and they obeyed God. They killed the lamb and they put the put the blood on the post and the mantle and the death angel passed over. And it was a, a feast that they celebrated. Remember that God delivered them out of Egypt. There's a feast of unleavened bread where they were reminded in haste which with they left Egypt. After the death angel passed, God said, go. They got up. They didn't even leaven their bread. They had unleavened bread. Why do we eat unleavened bread? Because leaven always represents sin. But yeast is always associated with sin. And just as the yeast was removed from the bread so they could get out of there quick, sin is to be removed from a Christian's life. But it was a reminder that it was God who can take away the sin. They had the feast of first fruits at the beginning of the harvest that signified Israel's gratitude and dependence on God. They would bring the sheaf of, of, of uh, the first grain offering to the priest who would wave it before the Lord and as an offering and remind them that God had delivered them from Egypt. And God, it's God who sustains us. And God who holds us to truth. They had the Feast of Weeks, the, the Feast of Pentecost, we know it as. It's fascinating. Because the Feast of Pentecost, Pentecost means 50, uh, it means, it, it happens 50 days after the First Fruits Festival. In fact, the Pentecost means 50th. Do you know what happened after 50 days after Jesus resurrected? Pentecost. Isn't that interesting that they, he foreshadowed that in the Old Testament? Then they had the Feast of Trumpets. The Rosh Hashanah marked the beginning of the 10 days of consecration and repentance before God. When we take communion, it's a time where we're supposed to reflect and remember that God offered His Son. What they would do is they, they, they would have... Uh, they would, they would take 10 days and they wouldn't work for those 10 days and they wouldn't do anything for those 10 days. It was just a time to reflect and recognize, hey, wait a second, I got to get right with God. And maybe we need to take 10 days before we take communion. Make sure that we're right before God before we take these, take these feasts. 
It was seven days set apart for burnt offerings and sin offerings to prepare for the Day of Atonement. And then you would have the Day of Atonement. At the end of it, the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would go in. Uh, the, the high priest would go in just days after the Feast of Trumpets. This day when the high priest went through the Holy of Holies. And you remember he had to wear the bells on his, on his clothing and he had to have the rope tied around his ankle because when he went into the Holy of Holies, he was making a sin offering to, to cover up Israel's sin for the year. It was foreshadowing of the Lamb of God. When John sees Jesus in the New Testament, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In the Old Testament, they killed that lamb. It would atone. Atone just means to cover up. It would cover up their sin for that time. But in the New Testament, when Jesus Christ came, He died and He shed the blood that would take away the sin of the world. You have the Feast of Booths. That's the tabernacle representing God living with Israel as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They would take that tabernacle and they would set it up everywhere they would go. They'd reset it up and the Holy of Holies in the middle and, the, and, and all the curtains and everything that was around, they would set it up. It was a feast reminding them that God took them out of there and God provided for them. Do you know that for 40 years they wandered in the wilderness and no one's shoes ever wore out? I want those kind of shoes. And the last one was the Feast of Purim to celebrate how God used Esther to stop King Ahasuerus from committing genocide on Israel because Mordecai wouldn't bow to Haman. But all of these feasts, God set this up through Israel to remind them that they are invited to partake with God, to be part of this plan that God had. God wants to work with us. He wants us to be part of His kingdom and part of His work. But second, God intends for these meals to continually remind His people of the covenant that He's established with them. More than just a verbal reminder, it engages each of the human senses. Taste, sound, smell, touch, sight, order. All of these, all of these celebrations, all of these feasts that they would do. Everything, that it had significance. They would... They would go, at, at the Feast of Booze, they would go to, uh, they'd go to Jerusalem and they would set up tents all over the city. And, and people would live in these tents for that time. It was, everything changed. It was a sight. The, the no leaven in the bread. It's different when we eat this cardboard in a few minutes or whatever this stuff is. It's not meant for taste. It's, a, it's, me, it's meant to remind you of something. And God set up all these feasts. He invited mankind to these meals. in order to help the whole person remember to stay faithful to the covenant promises made by the one who alone gives true life. But after God rescues Israel from Egypt, He invites them to become kingdom, a kingdom of priests and live and serve as His covenant partner. Exodus chapter 19 verse 6 says this, and you shall come to me, or you shall... Uh, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. This partnership will force them to make a choice. Will they define goodness like Adam and Eve decided to do? Will they decide what's good and what's bad? Will they do it how they want to do it? Or are they going to be willing to serve God and follow God and do it as He prescribes? We all have to face that, don't we? We find the answer in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. We're not going to read the whole thing, but they continually chose the false tree of life. That leads to self-destruction. They, 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 they didn't choose the tree of life. They chose the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They chose this wrong path. It comes to an end in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And I'm not going to read that either, but I, I just want you to listen to this. This is what he's saying in 2 Kings uh, 2, 1 through 7. He says, Alas, a sinful nation. People weighed down with iniquity. I've given you all of these covenants. I've given you all these rules to follow. I've given you the way to come and have life with me and participate in the life that I have for you. And for a while you followed it, but you wicked people, you've turned away from it. This is as they're going into the Babylonian captivity. And he says, You offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly, They've abandoned the Lord. 
They've despised the Holy One of Israel. They've turned away from Him. And that's just verse 4. Verse 5 states, Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? He says the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. I mean, he comes, it's like this. It's like this culmination of all of this sin. It's like just culminated to this one event, this one period of time, and it's like there's no hope. And Israel's about to go into this Babylonian captivity. They're going to go into 400 silent years where they're not going to hear from God for 400 years until Jesus comes. Until, until God comes to Zacharias. When Zacharias goes in to the Holy of Holies to make the offering, the angel of the Lord shows up to him and says, you're going to have a child. That child was John the Baptist who was going to be a pre-runner of Jesus. Then the angels, we know the stories. He appeared to Joseph and he appeared to Mary and he appeared to others. Because that was the hope. That time Israel's prophets talked about the day where the Lord would restore this broken covenant in spite of Israel's failure. I, I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that God offers hope in spite of my failures. You ever fail and feel like, God, what, how can you possibly use me? Lord, I've failed you again and again and again. I want, you, I want you to listen to this. Jeremiah 31, 31. He says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Listen to this one. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6 through 9. This verse just smacked me upside the head this week. It's just one of those ones. It was like those aha moments where you read it and you, it just dawns on you what exactly this is. Isaiah, a, another prophet that's writing during the Babylonian captivity, and he says, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich foods. Now, let me just tell you something. He's talking about Jesus Christ offering his blood and his body on the cross. And I'll show you that in a moment. But it says, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich foods, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all people. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, this curse was put on the world. They covered all the world. This sin covered all people. And he says this, this covering that's cast over all people, the veil that's spread over all nations, he will swallow up death forever. Every person that's ever been born had to die because of Adam's sin. But Jesus Christ is the second Adam. And Jesus Christ came to be the propitiation for my sin. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away every tear, or wipe away tear from all faces, and the reproach of his people will be taken away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. Let us be glad and rejoice in His salvation. The Old Testament ends with this glimmer of hope where they're, they, they, they're just, just like Adam and Eve. They've sinned and they've rejected God's rejected what God wanted them to do, rejected how He wanted them to live. And they're in total desperation. They're, they're, they're put into Babylonian captivity away from the temple. They're away from the tree of life. They're away from everything. But we come to the New Testament. We see Jesus' dinner invitation. When we get to the New Testament, we see this theme continue. Jesus invites people to a meal. I mean, think about this. The, the feeding of the 5,000. 
it, it's right at the time of Passover. People are all thinking about this stuff. And Jesus invites these people to a meal, but there's no food. And so he takes the few loaves and the few fish, and he feeds everybody with it. But that's not what I want to focus on. The next day, after he's fed all these people, the next day he goes to the synagogue, and this is what he teaches. John chapter 6, verses 53 to 59. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread of the, that the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Again, Jesus is inviting mankind to partake in eternal life by trusting in his sacrifice for us. When Jesus goes to the cross, which is why he came here, when Jesus goes and climbs that hill of Golgotha and is hung on that tree, that tree is representative of the tree of life. They thought the tree was going to kill Jesus, but that tree brought life to all of us. And unless we partake in that tree, unless we partake in the life that Christ offers by faith, receiving what Christ did on that cross, then we can't have eternal life. See, this is an invitation to trust Him and be transformed by His life. Later in John 15, 1, Jesus claims to be the vine that brings God's life into the world. He says to His disciples, uh, he, he says that the disciples are those who abide and remain in Him. Like branches connected to a vine. This abiding will permeate a, a person for, uh, it will permeate a person life healing transformation that makes them new. Jesus is offering himself as the new tree of life. And right before Jesus dies, he observes a Passover feast with his disciples. At that meal, Jesus takes the bread and he blesses it and he breaks it and he offers it to the disciples. He takes the cup of wine and gives thanks and offers it to the disciples. Again, he connects the bread to his body and the wine to his blood. And he invites the disciples to eat and drink in remembrance of him. Now listen to me. When we partake this, this isn't Jesus' blood. It's not his body. It's symbolic. But it's symbolic that we partake in the life that Christ offers. That we believe the tree of life. That we follow Jesus Christ. He's the only way that we can get to God. Luke chapter 22 and verse 20. It says, And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus was later led to the top of the hill where the Roman soldiers killed him on a different kind of tree, a wooden cross. John chapter 19, verses 16 through 18, it says this, So they handed him to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two other men on either side, and Jesus in between. They broke his body and poured out his blood, thinking they could destroy him with their tree of death. But they underestimated Jesus. They tried to take his life, 
but they did not realize that Jesus willfully gave it. Why did Jesus come and be born in a manger? Because he's the Lamb of God who takes away the of the world. I want to read that verse again in Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9 again. Because I want you to hear this after we've heard this whole story. Isaiah is writing it there on Golgotha. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food. A feast of well-aged wine. Of rich food full of marrow. Of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that's cast over all people. What happened to the veil after Christ died? It was rent. I don't have to go, I don't have to send a priest to go to the Holy of Holies anymore because Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. He rent that curtain. Now I have access, I can go directly to God. And if I will abide in him and he with me, I will do great things. Why? Because it's not me. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will do many things. Jesus, I I just keep reading. It says, he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken it will be said on that day behold this is our God and we have waited for him that he might save us this is the Lord we have waited for him let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation see Jesus is the feast the rich food who swallowed up the covering that's cast over all people, the veil that's been spread over all nations. He's the second Adam. The first Adam partook and that curse of sin came upon all of us. Jesus is the second Adam. And Jesus came and he took away all that reproach. And all we have to do is trust him. See, it's taking the fruit of the tree of life participating in this meal that saves us and then abiding there. We prepare to partake in this communion this morning. I wonder, have you accepted God's invitation to new life? Listen, the the whole reason we celebrate Christmas is because God offered the greatest gift that's ever been given. Why do we pass out gifts? Why do we celebrate and and have all of this stuff? Because God sent His Son. The greatest gift. My question is, if you're here this morning, you've never received the gift of salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ. What a Christmas this is because now you understand what the gift is. It wasn't a baby in a manger It was God with us who came to pay that ransom so that I could be ransomed back to God. Maybe you're here today and you've never received that gift. Man, today is your lucky day because that gift is free to everyone. Whosoever will may come. Maybe this morning is the day that you receive that gift that God offered. If you haven't, that's your invitation this morning. You can do it right in your seat. Say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. God, I know that my sin separated me from you. God, I know that you sent your son to come down to take away that penalty for sin. And today, I want to partake with you. And I want to receive that gift that you gave, your blood and your body that you gave for me. I want to partake in that. If you do that, then you'll be saved. If you're here this morning and you've accepted the invitation to life with Christ, you've already been saved. What a day to celebrate and remember. But communion, we remember as communion, it is a time to remember. 
It's remember, look back at what Christ did. Look back at the cross and look back and remember what he did on that cross. But it's also a time for introspection, to, to look inside and say, Lord, am I, am I abiding in this life? Am I abiding in the vine? Am I living the life that you've called me to live? Or Lord, am I just going through the motions? I mean, the children of Israel, for, they, did, they, went to, they went to the synagogue, they still did the sin offerings, they still did the blood offerings, they did all the meals, but their hearts were far from them. And God rejected them because they weren't doing, they, they, weren't, they were just going through the motions, it wasn't real. God says, I want it to be real. In church, I think sometimes we just go through the motions. And I wonder, are we seriously introspective when we take communion? And realizing, God, this is serious stuff. So church, if you're here and you're a Christian, you ought to examine yourself before you take communion. And make sure, Lord, is my life right before you? Am I living my life as I'm supposed to live? Am I, am I loving my wife the way I'm supposed to? Am I, am I loving my children the way that I'm supposed to? Am I, am I loving people that don't like me as I'm supposed to? Communion is a time for forgiveness and repentance. It's a time to look inside and say, Lord, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? But it's also a time of forgiveness where I can say, God, forgive me. I can say to other people, forgive me. See, this meal invites us to remember Jesus. It represents to the senses, just like the meals God established for the Israelites, the life and death of Jesus. The meal's not something we do for Jesus. It reminds me what Jesus has done for me. He invites us to participate with him. Luke. Just a moment. I, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you to come up. If you're, if you're a Christian, I'm just going to give you a couple rules. There is what's called closed communion, which means that only people would, that are members of a church could take it. We don't observe that. There's open communion, which means everybody can take it, and we don't observe that either. But there's what's called close communion. And close communion is if you are, if you're a Christian, if you've accepted Jesus Christ and partaken in the meal with him, that you've accepted what he did on the cross as the sacrifice for your sin, and, and he's forgiven you of your sin, and you know that, we want you to partake in communion with us because you're part of the body of Christ. So if, you're, if you want to take communion this morning, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to come up, take the elements, go back to your seat, and then while, we're, while you're sitting there, just sit there for a few moments and just think about it and think about what Christ did. Seek forgiveness for your sins. Make sure you're right before God before we take communion. And then in just a few moments, I'm going to, uh, we're going to partake in the elements and the service is going to be over. But my prayer this morning is that when we take communion, we look at it differently, that we realize that communion is representing what, that God invited us to life. And this life that's only found in him. So I want to invite you to come this morning. Take communion, go back to your seat, and when it's time, we'll walk you through the elements.